Well, welcome back to our second session, third session for the day. First of all, I want to thank Jerry and Charlie for putting this whole thing together. Uh, this is really a great forum because this is a topic that never exhausts itself with things to talk about and challenges that we have. I'm Tom Temin. I'm host of the Federal Drive with Tom Temin weekday mornings on Federal News Radio, part of the Federal News Network, 1500 AM. You can tune in for the replay this afternoon on the way home from 3 to 7. And so I hope you'll be sure to tune in. I've been in this market for going on to 30 years now. And just to give you some sense of perspective, the first Washington picture on my Washington fabulous me wall is standing next to Congressman Jack Brooks. So that's how far back I've been following acquisition. And people say, do you, what do you do? I said, well, one of the things we cover is federal acquisition. And if they don't fall asleep, it turns out to be an endlessly fascinating topic, so I'm really enthusiastic and glad to be here this morning. But our guest today is really interesting. Uh, you probably know uh, Denver Lee Riggleman III, formerly Congressman Riggleman in his freshman year from the 5th District of Virginia. The brief biography, he spent four years in the Air Force in electronic warfare, knows that end of things. He was the CEO of several defense companies, one of which he just sold before becoming a congressman. But the most important thing, and the thing that really said to me, this is a guy I could work with, is that he owns a family distillery in which distributes gin, whiskey, and uh, vodka. And moonshine. And moonshine. So the stuff, all colors of whiskey. All colors. Yep. So the clear all the way down to the dark brown. So. <laughs> I mean, a guy that makes whiskey it can't be all bad. So let's give a round of applause and welcome <laughs> Congressman Riggleman. We're just going to have an open conversation. If there are questions, I, I, there was going to be a pad with questions on them, but, or else just shout, oh, here comes the pad, OK. And you promise this won't die? Uh, OK. All right, I'll do that. And so everyone knows where to send questions. Yeah, you know what, or just shout. It's not that big a room. Isn't it a great thing about Washington that all the grand ballrooms are downstairs below street level? So if war breaks out, you want to be at a banquet in Washington because you'll be underground. But I think we'll start from the point of view that I thought was really well expressed by uh, Steve Rodriguez in the prior session, and that is good procurement, good stewardship of dollars, good acquisition programs really start with good policy a good sense of where it is we think we should be going, where we want to be. It doesn't work from the ground up. Good process, good acquisition stems from good policy. And maybe that's where some of the gaps are right now. I think fundamentally in the Cold War, it was a pretty clear, we had world, you know, what, what do they call it, great powers competition then. But we knew what we had to do as a country. And I think we knew we wanted to preserve free enterprise and the liberty of men and women against a, a, a system that crushed that, and we knew what we had to do to get there. Today, things are a little less clear, so uh, nevertheless, we still have a national imperative, and we have an acquisition system that is supposed to support that. So, Congressman, I'd like to start with something a little more prosaic, though, and that is your experience as a federal contractor. How horrible was it? How good was it? And maybe you can talk a little bit about the differences between winning the deal and managing the deal. Yeah, I mean, um, for me, every second of being a DOD contractor and having my own company was pure hell until I sold the company. I just want everybody to know that. So, um, no, um, so uh, my background, I think I was very fortunate. We talked about my background. I'm actually a Mustang. So um, I was prior enlisted in the Air Force um, and when I was avionics and radars. Uh, and, 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 you know, as the oldest of eight kids, we really didn't know how to spell college. So, uh, but believe it or not, I had a captain. Uh, his last name was, was Schwing, believe it or not, S-C-H-W-I-N-G. Uh, was not his call sign, by the way. So Captain Schwing brought me in, and he said, hey, we think you're barely smart enough to go to college. Why don't you give it a shot? So, um, I, um, uh, so seven of us got chosen, and we could pick any college in the country. And since my, my father was an electrician at UVA, I got into the University of Virginia, believe it or not. And uh, I know it's hard to believe. Um, so uh, got in there and, and got number one out of my ROTC class, went into Air Force Intelligence. And what was odd, you don't think things really match up, but my degree was in for, uh, Foreign Affairs Eastern Europe, and this really does get to the question, was in Foreign Affairs Eastern Europe, former Yugoslavia, and 10 months later I was on the um, Romanian-Serbian border tracking Russians with a Tipsy 75 mobile radar. 
And what's incredible about this is I never thought, you know, my avionics skills would match with a degree I got in college. And then there I was, you know, in the intelligence career field, um, just like that as an Air Force intelligence officer. What happened, as you guys know, I mean, it's just, it was a crazy time between 99 and 2001. So 99, I was in uh, Romania and Serbia. 2000, I was training the Omanis on F-16 operations uh, with um, air tasking order types of issues. And then in 2001, 9-11 happened. So I was the B-1 intelligence officer that uh, mission planned the first bombing runs to Afghanistan. And so by 2002, um, I was supposed to go to weapons school. If anybody here is Air Force or anything like that, I was supposed to be a patch. Um, but my wife got very sick, so they sent me to the National Security Agency. And what's incredible is they put me in something called National Tactical Integration at the time, and this weird thing came in and swooped me up called Big Safari, if anybody knows who Big Safari is. So getting contracts, you know, through Big Safari, um, really how I got started wasn't that I was incredibly intelligent, right? It's that I was in a mafia. So um, I, was a I, I got to learn things and do things that other people didn't get a chance to learn. So when um, I got out of the military as a captain in 2003, I was swooped up by National Tactical Integration and Special Projects in the National Security Agency. Then uh, when JIDO stood up, we set up the, uh, the Counter ID Operations Integration Center in Northern Virginia, and then uh, did a lot of stuff with even counter hostage stuff in South America. So when I started my company in 2007, the fortunate thing was is I knew enough people to get started at the age of 37 just based on experience. So. I actually thought it would be sort of easy. I know I see Lidos here, and uh, SAIC, I want to tell you guys how I got started. You won't believe this. I had no idea how contracting worked. I saw a piece of paper sitting on a table, and I'm like, why does my name, why does this say that they're charging three times more than my salary? I don't understand what this paper means. Um, and it was at that time in 2004, I thought maybe I could start a company. I did in 2007, um, and trying to get those first contracts were awful. It took me over a year to get my first contract. I had to get an investor. Um, $92,000 I lived off on that year while I was trying to get contracts, but my first contract was a sole source contract with Big Safari uh, as a subcontractor under L3, right? So, um, and uh, L3 Comcept at the time. And then uh, by two months later, I got my first contract in NSA um, in National Tactical Integration Office because we were vetting requirements mm -hmm. uh, to build cool technical things. That's honestly how I got my start. It wasn't anything grand. It was just sort of putting your nose to the ground and thinking you can figure it out. Um, and that whole time of trying to get contracts and managing contracts, I honestly didn't know what I was doing. You know, it was like a pig looking at a wristwatch, you know, when I first started, you know, in the first year, you know, trying to get through, you know, what is a loaded rate anyway, you know? How do I calculate fringe and overhead? How do I even get a loaded rate if I've never had a loaded rate? Who do I talk to? Why does a Maryland procurement office suck so bad, right? All those questions. Um, <laughs> you know, that you ask yourself as a contractor. So, um, but all, all of a sudden I started getting contracts. I got a sole source prime, very small. All my stuff was in data, like vertically integrating data uh, in the non-kinetic space after I did kinetic stuff um, because we went after double digit SAMs and started that kind of thing. Um, but then we started going after specific individuals for specific devices. And um, we were able to transfer that over. So I went from dropping bombs really to trying to track people using data. Um, so that was a huge learning curve for me to find the right people to do it. And from starting the company to managing it, I got to sell it in about five years in 2012. But I will tell you the hardest thing for me, and, and you guys know this, are trying to find people that are cleared, right? Trying to transfer clearances, right? Trying to find out what the heck a COO or COR, what they mean by some of the contract language and terminology. Are mm -hmm. contracts wired? How do you make it in a small business setting? You know, I'm an SDVOSB, how do I do that? Should we go after minority contracts, right? My partner, African American, 50-50, right? Do we go after 8A? How do we do all this stuff? Um, how do I even get a C-Port E thing? I did a 70-page C-Port E, you know, small business proposal, and you know, we actually made it up from scratch and got in, and we figured we could just make stuff up and do things, we're gonna do really well. Um, so it was all those things of managing contracts that we had to learn from scratch. We had no training. Um, I, you know, my background was technical and, and uh, you know, Eastern Europe. I mean, I could tell you the difference between Serbia and Macedonia, but that didn't really help with being a CEO of a technical company. So uh, managing all those things were very difficult, and I, but I think I was very fortunate that I could start from a technical place where at least I could sort of knuckle drag my way 
you know, through the, through the technical task orders, you know, and get stuff done. And that was before, of course, the OTA re-blossomed from 1958 and then 1998 and so forth, and now it's a big deal. And let me ask you about what the congressional thinking is. We heard warnings this morning from the earlier panel that possible abuse or alleged abuse and overuse of the other transactions authorities could result in a crackdown for, or, or withdrawal of that authority from Congress, that kind of thing. Although Congress actually upped the DOD limit on what it could spend on OTs over the last right. couple of years. So uh, from the House standpoint, what, what is the thinking or are they thinking about it? Uh, how blunt do you, does everybody want me to be? Be as blunt as okay. you'd like. Is this all non-attribution? Could everybody turn off their phones, please? Um, if there was any way I could live off OTAs, I would have. You know, what's, what's that? There is press here. Hi, press. How y'all doing? Um, I'm press for that matter. But. That's fine. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I, as far as since, since that's the fact, I have heard of no, no issues. I think everything's perfect. <laughs> no, I think um, you know we talk about OTAs. You know, for me, I talked about big safari and sole sourcing. Um, you know, the thing was when I was a small company, I was always looking at OTAs you know, how we could leverage OTAs, right? Because it seemed to be an easier way to do business. And I don't know if anybody else found that out, but, uh, you know, especially back in, um, you know, I was doing business between 2007 and 2012. And, uh, mm -hmm. but once I got out, um, like we said, we started a distillery. Three and a half years later, I got a call from the Pentagon uh, to come back and build something uh, for vertically integrated network attack, which, which until the day I was elected, I was a senior consultant for electronic warfare and countermeasures at the Pentagon. Um, so uh, that was till the day I was elected. And we would try to find OTAs to leverage, right, for a lot of this work. And so, and that's why I think uh, when you're looking at abuse of OTAs, I think what happens is, is that the, the contractual environment we are in wants to push you to OTAs because it's such a bear to try to do anything in the normal contractual cycle, mm -hmm. especially when you have monies on a sole source or you're doing non-competitive stuff based on mission operations. So if you've got an office that has $30 million that they have to spend each year, and they, they, they can't not spend it, right, or they're going to get crushed because their portfolio goes away, um, OTAs seem to be the way to go. So although we were working through other sole sourcing or we were doing directed, um, sort of directed, I would say, selection of certain individuals and companies, we were always looking at OTAs to leverage because the, it seemed like trying to work in the normal contractual process is really like sticking a pencil in your eye through your frontal burn, you know, through your, for your, through your frontal lobe and then trying to get through things. So I, I, I really haven't, as far as abuses, I don't have anybody coming in and say, hey, we hate OTAs or it's a bad thing. Um, I'm on the Financial Services Committee, but I am on the National Security Subcommittee. So for me, I would say bluntly, I think if you could figure out how to use OTAs correctly, I think it's, it's something you have to do until we fix the contractual process. That's about how blunt I'm going to be on. All right, good. And um, I want to ask you a personal question. You've walked through several doors in your life. One was the Air Force, which is a great big door that you were just a little tiny piece of. The other has been the companies you built, walked through the door as the owner. And then you walked through the door as a member of Congress, and you've got a button that gets you on that elevator and all of these other deferential types of things. It's not the most fun elevator. <laughs> What's it really like to be a freshman in Congress, a member of the minority party, and is your office anywhere close to Capitol Hill? Do we have press here? You said we have press here. <laughs> um, uh, to be a freshman congressman, um, you know, the learning curve straight up. You theoretically think you know what you're getting into uh, when you get elected. By the way, this is my first elected office. Uh, if you could tell from my language, I probably haven't learned to be a congressman yet specifically, right? So, um, uh, but this is my first elected office. And um, you think, when, when you get into this, it's sort of in your DNA. If, you know, people that are military in here, you think, see things that are wrong. Um, even though you've never been involved in politics, I was always behind the door. Um, I looked at this as a service job. I don't need the retirement. I promise you that. Um, and I don't need this paycheck. Uh, but what I needed to do was to help people who I thought were being bullied. And that's a huge list of things. When you have over-regulation, listen guys, once, once I did five years working through the federal acquisition regulations, I really thought that I knew what awful was until I dealt with local, state, and federal governments in trying to build a distillery. And I am not understating that. It was one of the worst things I've ever tried to do was to build a manufacturing plant from the ground up. When your wife is in tears, we had to pay a quarter million dollars just in regulatory fees, another $200,000 in legal fees. You know, just for the building and the shell itself, it was about 900,000. 
but we spent another 800,000 just on other stuff so we could open. So instead of spending 800,000, we spent about 1.7 million of our own treasure trying to get this thing going. And um, it was devastating to our family and devastating to what we were trying to do and nobody would listen. So I got involved in politics and it was accidental. I don't know if you guys know the story, but our guy, the fifth district congressman got out for alcoholism. It's a little ironic that I own a distillery, but he um, <laughs> got out for alcoholism and I had four days to prepare for a convention and nobody knew who I was. And I won by one vote, one vote. And then I won the congressional general race by 20,000 votes. So you're looking at somebody who has been in politics for a year and about four months my entire life, my entire life. So when I walked onto <laughs> Capitol Hill, the first day I knew it was crazy because, you know, the majority switched and we were supposed to have a, a party at two o'clock and get sworn in. Well, we got sworn in about five o'clock. My family didn't know where to go. It was absolute chaos. And I realized right then that Congress, I didn't know if this was actually what I wanted to do because they couldn't, they couldn't organize, right, like a, like a tea party. Um, it, was, it was unbelievable to me uh, what was going on up there. So the thing that I've had to react to is that as a legislator, you are not an executive. You have to work with others. Um, you have to get very good at getting your face kicked in. Um, you know as a minority party, there's nothing you can do unless you work with the other side. There is nothing you can do. And I've been fortunate enough that there's enough prior military and government on the other side of the aisle that I can have a conversation with them. And I think that's the fortunate thing that we have. But talking about how to get through social media, people calling you every name that you can imagine, being hated by 49% of the public as soon as you're elected, whether you have an R or a D beside your name. The fact is you're watching something happen and you can't stop it. It's like a slow moving train wreck. Um, and the uh, only thing you can do is say, wow, that's a slow moving train wreck and I don't want to get anywhere near it. Um, <laughs> So uh, those are, that's what Congress feels like right now, but there's a flip side to it. We are getting things done. There are small things getting done on the technical side. I'm writing a lot of small technical bills, and those small technical bills are making their way through because, you know, if you can't dazzle them with brilliance, you baffle them with you know what. So you try to get through and you do these things, but these small technical bills are getting through that are going to help people. Um, I wish I could tell you how bad every day was. Um, I'd much rather be on my 50 acres with my wife making bourbon. I think that's a, that's a better life. But if you, if you don't have people in politics who hate politics, and if you don't have people in there who've served before, who are actually doing it for the right reason, I think you just get a huge band of narcissists and sociopaths that are trying to run the country, right? So that's, that's how I look at it. I would rather have people like me who hate politics, and every day they know they're gonna burn out before everybody else because they actually care. I'd rather have them in there than those who think of this as a career field. If, 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 if that makes sense. I have to tell you, the first legislator that I ever knew in my life, and this was going back 40 years, was a New Hampshire state rep. And New Hampshire in those days, I don't know, maybe it's still the case, they had each year of the two-year session, they had a 30-day session. That was it. It was literally citizen farmer legislators. And the woman, her name was, uh, God, I have to... We, it was uh, Jean White, her name was, and uh, she owned the gun shop in Ringe, New Hampshire. So that's, thing, well, that's legislators, that's real people, right? And, uh, but not so much in Washington, I guess. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's the other thing too, and you guys probably know this, is you don't realize the amount of time I'm on the phone. Um, you guys heard of dialing for dollars, you've heard of all these things. There's all these small things that you don't realize. You know, oh, Denver, hey, in order, you need to raise a half million dollars a quarter, right? I'm like, what? You know, so, uh, you know, and, and I think it's those kind of things. It's those things. It's, it's helping with your committees. It's brokering deals with your committees. I take about 30 to 40 meetings per day with constituents. My day starts at 0530. It's usually done at 11 p.m. That's a normal day in D.C. for me um, because, you know, you have to go to the dinners, right? Anyway, so um, there's a lot of dinners with free food. But anyway, so, um, and I hit them all. But anyway, so... Um, so, but you have all these things that you have to do, and um, you know, I think when you have a citizen legislator or somebody who wants to come out and do this, I think what you don't realize is it's not just, it's not the job. You got you guys know if you're a CEO or if you do, it's not you're not worried about the technical aspects of everything. You're worried about you get your first sexual harassment complaint, which I did about a year in as a CEO. How do you deal with that, right? How do you deal with the fact that your money's just aren't jiving, right? 
or you got incremental monies coming out on your contract and you can't afford the next month. You're going to factor, you're going to get a line of credit, right, as a new company. You know, those, those things I, I felt like I could control, even though it was awful. Um, on the Hill, you just can't. And uh, that's, that's really what the experience is like for me right now. Well, tell us about your work on the National Security Subcommittee of the Finance sure. Committee and what's going on there and what are, you, what are the issues? Right. Well, one of, my, one of my contracts was with OFAC, filed the money under Department of Treasury. So um, they put me on the National Security Subcommittee. Um, what we're looking at is a lot of anti-money laundering issues uh, overseas, looking at sanctioned banks or banks that are working with sanctioned people they shouldn't be. That's sort of who I'm going after right now, uh, just to let you guys know. Um, but also, I'm on the AIML Working Group for Artificial Intel Intelligence and Machine Learning. So there's a big data science thrust that's going on because of the Department of Treasury and the Fed. Um, if you heard weird things like Fedwire going down for four hours, or you hear about the Capital One breach, that's all the stuff that I'm working on right now. And I know that I was military and did a bunch of data science stuff, but it, it does, it does sort of lock in. Uh, my experience sort of locks into what they're trying to do. And I'm the only one that I know of on the entire committee and actually in Congress that has done decades of data aggregation and analysis work. Um, and not, not just on the technical side, but you guys know on the policy side, and you probably realize, a lot of you here, that sometimes it's governance and policy that stops you from getting any technical work done. So when I went to the Pentagon, they said, hey, Denver, how do you winnow through all this crap you know, on policy, and why in the heck can't NSA share data with NRO, or why are we having problems with tactical data being you know, shared with national data? So um, anyhow, that's, that's, that's what's going on there. But if you guys look at the bills that's coming out, not only the subcommittees, but the full committee, um, it's very political and very divisive. Uh, everything goes into, oh my gosh, I know that you're trying to stop terrorists um, and this bank you're trying to work with to stop these guys from taking trade secrets and monies or their diasporas putting money into the economy over here, but you guys are banking logging companies and we hate you. So that's what happens. We go from a technical discussion to a political discussion just like that, even though it has nothing to do with the subject at hand. So, but. There's technical bills that are coming out that you guys are going to want to know about, especially on the data science side and especially on the investment side. So when you're looking at this and you're looking at the NDAA or you're looking at some of the mini omnibuses, you really want to check into some of the things that are going on. And let me give you an example, XM Bank. There's a straight reauthorization coming up for XM, mm -hmm. but you're looking at the guy who wrote the China portion of it. So as a freshman, so not all of it, but when you look at the specific industries that were identified in the small business goals, yeah, it was me. And when you're looking at the amount of money that we're looking at for XM Bank and the transparency for XM Bank, that was me. Um, and, that, and now you're looking at state-owned enterprises for China, everybody in here should be looking at, if you have a data science or, or, or a company where you're doing acquisitions on that side, I know you're looking at the HASC, you're looking at the HIPSI, you know, you're looking at the things going on there. If you're looking at financial services, you better be looking at um, the full committee, but what they're doing on the subcommittees for financial institutions and national security. I'm telling you right now, there's, it's an amazing thing going on there on the technical side. Yes, because we've heard speaker after speaker here and pretty much the whole conference circuit in Washington the past season, that everyone seems to know that we are at war, is one way to put it, with China on the cyber front and on the theft of intellectual property and the reuse against us. Is that a concern? at a top level in Congress also? That is one of the number one concerns in Congress, um, especially on financial services. Uh, if you go to HASC, uh, on the Intel Committee, what China is doing, but you know there's other countries, guys, right? I mean, it's not just China we're looking at. We're looking at Russia, looking at Iran. Um, you're looking at some other countries uh, that, are, that have some capabilities. Um, but what China is doing right now is, is um, pretty significant. And I can talk about this on the unclassified side, um, if anybody didn't think Huawei was a problem, right, um, this is something that I've been looking at for a long time. And so when you're looking at China right now, one of the main things we're looking at is what they're doing to us. And I can't go to all of it. Obviously, I can't go into it here. But um, you, you can read the newspapers. And what you're reading in unclassified press, um, you can multiply that by a couple and uh, think about all the things that are going on behind the scenes right now and why, if you're reading legislation that specifically targets certain areas with certain language, please read between the lines of that language, right? Because that is, we are, that is probably our number one priority in fin financial services, not only anti-money laundering, but um, the ability of certain countries um, to penetrate our networks.
which is, should scare the hell out of everybody. Okay, any questions from the floor? There's nothing on this pad. I don't know what the email address is, but any questions? I'll we can... answer any question, uh, even about distilleries and whiskey, and um, I'm happy to do that. By the way, my wife is the master distiller. Uh, my daughters run our Virginia and Pennsylvania locations. Um, so um, you can ask me any question about that. If I don't know the answer to any technical question, as you guys know, I used to be a CEO and then DOD, I was an intelligence briefer. So if I don't know the question, I promise I will make something up that's completely plausible. So um, I will do whatever I can to help with that. Uh, in the meantime, there are uh, a lot of acquisition going on for the things you just mentioned, artificial intelligence, data science. There are a lot of data transparency acts. There's a mandate now that agencies have to have chief data officers and machine learning. And there's a lot of concern about the application of that technology. What, what's the thinking from your point of view on how that's best inculcated into government programs? Well, we, um, I could tell you uh, an example of how everything is sort of uh, merged together when you're talking about um, data science, AI, ML, and advanced manufacturing. Um, and I could talk about the 5th District of Virginia very quickly. Um, I don't know if you guys know the size of the 5th District. It's 10,000 square miles, so it's bigger than New Jersey. Um, so, um, by the way, I'm driving to Danville tonight. I don't know if you guys know how far it is from here to Danville. Um, I get to do that, so you should be very happy for me. Um, so, um, but for instance, in the NDAA, um, we had an amendment for Danville, you know, which has gone through so an economic crisis, but really bouncing back with some incredible management there, uh, for critical shipbuilding skills, um, for that to be trained there um, so that they could support, you know, the shipyards. Um, I went and saw their training program. Guys, it is guys swinging hammers at the same time they're utilizing their laptops, right, with schematics for real-time tracking while they're doing their actual work so that they don't have to go back and forth and look at schematics and things like that. So they're using ML and AI, um, and you have a person, and I was talking to him, he goes, you know, I've been doing this for 25 years. I pretty much swung a hammer, used a screwdriver. He goes, now I'm using advanced programs to identify specific areas, even down to a weld that might be out of place or, or not good or under stress. They can go in there and look at everything and, and start to manipulate the entire ship, right, using this and then identifying instead of going into, I, I don't know if anybody here was a mechanic in the military, but you had your old tech orders, do you remember the old TOs that you had and you had to go get TO 31-563 Bravo and then look and say, oh gosh, this foam flex is broken right here. I don't know what to do, but I'm a knuckle dragger, so I'm going to go up there and look at the TO and try to fix it. Um, now it tells them what's wrong immediately based on what's happened in the past. So that's the kind of things that you're seeing. You're seeing this merging of manufacturing and, and, and machine learning, which is spectacular. It's fascinating. So, um, and, I would, and I would humbly submit, I think that's where the future is in a lot of the areas that you're looking at on the training programs, you know, colleges and tr tr um, training this. So how do we do that? So that's what I'm seeing. I'm seeing this huge merge between manufacturing, machine learning, and technology that's just fascinating. You know, as we go forward. And that brings me to the other question which came up earlier, and you mentioned it, is the clearance process. And October 1st, there were kind of two big developments. One was the, cons the beginning of the consolidation of the GSA schedules, and the other was the official inculcation of the clearance process into the Defense Department. It's really back to the future, to be honest, and out of the, general, out of the OPM. Is that something that Congress, now that they've sort of allowed it to happen more than caused it to happen, or 50-50, at least is watching, because that's one of the biggest contractor concerns I think there is. I think it is. I, uh, listen, there's no more fun than I ever had when you went to a Ford location. They're like, you think you passed your clearances on J-Pass and they have scattered castles or nothing, right? And then you're sitting there like, hey, my social security number is blah, 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 blah. I promise you I have these clearances. Well, we don't have you on the list, right? I don't know if anybody's gone through that in their adult lives. Um, or it's just an idiot. So anyway, so um, that don't. So um, so you have all this happening. So when I talked about working across the aisle, very small technical bills. Um, so me and Elaine Loria from Virginia, um, Democrat from the second district in Virginia, um, we're doing a bill right now where every single military member um, automatically gets a full scope poly if they're in the intelligence field. And how do we grease that, right? So um, I don't know if you guys have ever had the issue with a CI poly to a full scope poly with the clearances, you know, trying to get somebody with a CI, you know, to, I can't remember the name anymore, there was some kind of bridge clearance that they had to get before they got their full scope. Um, we thought that was ridiculous. So what we're looking at, and this is financial services, this is HASC, is how do we, how do we clean up the clearance process uh, and how do we make it go a little bit quicker? 
Um, and I think, you know, small things like that, you think, well, Denver, what's the difference there? I don't know if I came out of the military with a CI poly and it took me, I don't know, eight months, right, to get, to get polyed up completely just to get on a contract. So um, I think small things like that could help. But uh, we have got to clean up the clearance process. It is ridiculous how long it takes. And it's ridiculous how many separate stovepipe systems we have processing clearances. I think it's something we got to fix. All right. Any questions from the floor? Sir. Uh, stand up, shout, tell us who you are and where you're from. <laughs> Yeah, there is, and, and thanks for the question. So, um, you know, one of the first bills I passed, it was my bill, but I gave it to the Democratic side so I could get it through. You know, I became the principal co-sponsor, so I just gave it to Jennifer West Wexton from Virginia's 10th and said, hey, I can't get it through. Will you get it through? I'll co-sponsor. She goes, sure, it's a good bill. So there are things like that happening. And um, I think what you see, though, is that you're getting to a point with this administration where it's shirts and skins, right? So. Um, Sometimes it's not very objective. I know that surprises everybody on the political side, but um, <laughs> so uh, I think it's getting to shirts and skins, but it's just like working with Elaine Loria from Virginia Second on the clearance bill. Um, or we had, and I know this is not in the DOD sector, but we had something called the Ensuring Lasting Smiles Act. There was uh, congenital deformities for small children that weren't being covered by healthcare companies based on a very tiny loophole. So I went to Colin Peterson from Minnesota, a Democrat, and like, listen, we're not gonna get this through. Will you be the primary guy? He said, absolutely. And I'm going to do the right thing. And I think, um, who cares if it's the right thing, if I'm the guy carrying the bill or the principal co-sponsor, right? I mean, who gives a rats? And uh, that's a scientific term that I use a lot. So, um, <laughs> um, because I don't want to say rat's ass. So, you know, so, um, um, <laughs> but, um, you know, and I think, but you know what happens is I got, I was one of the first Republican freshmen to get a bill through. Uh, because I was willing to do that. Are there some lines I'm not going to cross? Absolutely. Are there some people in my committee that are very difficult to work with? Yes. I mean, I'll be honest with you, and I'm not badly, but I haven't talked a whole lot to Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, Rashida Tlaib, or Presley. They're on my financial services committee. We just don't see eye to eye on policy. And I try to never attack people. I only attack policy, right? Because that stuff can boomerang on you pretty hard. Um, plus, I only have 12 Twitter followers. So anyway, so... Um, <laughs> I said, no, I have more than that. I have like 20. So anyway, um, but um, yeah, so there are people over there, especially if you're looking at some of the prior military people over there and prior, you know, uh, case officers, things like that. You can work with them. But, but lately, I think in the last two months, in the first six to seven months, there was a little bit of a kumbaya between the new Republicans and the new moderate Democrats, right? We're like, hey, we can work together. But now it's, it's become pretty, pretty vitriolic because of the pressure you know, that, 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 that they have to go a certain way. And I think that's the difficult thing in the minority party. Once that pressure is exerted, things can stop pretty quickly. Even if it's for the best of intentions, um, they don't want your bipartisan score to go up. So all of a sudden, you don't have anybody who wants to work with you on the other side. And then you've got to find very small technical ways to get things done uh, through rulemaking um, and things like that. So it's been, it's interesting. It really is interesting. Um, but. Uh, one last thing, Susie Lee from Nevada, Democrat. We, uh, Democrat and Republican, started the Veterans Education Caucus. I mean, that's something I'm really proud of, right? And then I tried to start a, because <laughs> I'm an idiot. I tried to start a caucus called the OTICS Caucus, Operational Technology and, and uh, Information Control Systems. And they're like, that's so nerdy. Nobody likes that name. We're not going to start that caucus. So anyway, you know, you have things like that that happen too. So, but no, people are working together. It's just very difficult in this environment right now. And where we're at is we have impeachment after impeachment inquiry going on. People just don't want to work together right now in a, in a big way. Well, I'm going to finish up with a larger philosophical question, and it's one I ask many members of Congress over the years. And I think anyone who's an American, anyone who owns a business or works for a business, anyone who is a federal employee, I believe should be concerned about this question. And I'm asking it in a very nonpartisan way. But I think it would, you know, Barack Obama even acknowledged that the strength that we have as a government and as a military force hopefully for good throughout the world, is ultimately paid for by our economy. And we're piling now on, we've kind of gotten used, to, we've normalized trillion dollar a year addition to the national debt. And we know where the spending is, 
rising, and we know what's going to happen with the debt load should the interest rates change. Everybody knows all these numbers. The government publishes the numbers. They're manifest. They're online. You can look them up any time. So the arithmetic is agreed to and understood. Does anybody on the Hill think in terms of the long-term fiscal condition of the country and short of spending every dollar we have on this or spending every dollar we have on that or completely cutting this or completely cutting that, have any sense that maybe this is something some Congress is going to have to take on? I think it's a grave danger. I mean, I, I'll tell you guys, I looked at the, uh, um, at the last budget we voted for, and I will tell you this, and I'm sure it was like, oh my gosh, you were a CEO in defense contract, and I voted no. Um, and, and really what we looked at is I think there's something that we're afraid to get in front of. Um, we talk about defense spending. Um, we talk about discretionary spending. But I don't know, and I'm sure you're aware, this is a very smart audience, what our mandatory spending load is every year, right? It's 72%, right? Um, when you look at the DOD, when you're looking at 719 billion or 730 billion of a 4.4 trillion dollar budget, you know, people can scream 100 billion dollars this way or that way, but what are we gonna do about the mandatory spending, right, on those social programs? And people are absolutely terrified to address that. Um, I'm not, right? So um, why, why are we not why are we so afraid? It's because I think everybody in Congress right now, when you're looking at what's happening, and what I didn't realize is the incredible amount of issues that you have in each, each district and how you have to talk and deal make between each. If anybody doesn't think deals don't happen on the Hill, probably a little naive, right? Um, you guys know there's no perfect, right? There's the world we want to live in and there's the world we do live in, right? I try to live in the world we do live in, right? That's sort of my life. I'm not an ideologue. I think that there has to come a time where we're working across the aisle, but when we're looking at spending right now, it is dire. Um, but if we don't, so I think, I think five years ago, mandatory spending was about 65% of the budget. Now it is 72%. That number is extreme. So what are we gonna do in the next five years? Are we gonna put our head in the sand? When are we gonna get $30 trillion, right? When are we gonna hit 30 trillion? It's not gonna be too long, right? So I think at some point, we gotta look at how our spending habits are and I'll be honest with you guys, I loved it. I loved it when we got more OCO funding and I could actually you know, push a contract up. Don't get me wrong, I love that stuff, right? I knew I was doing the right thing. But at some point, we're gonna have to look at spending, but we're gonna have to look at the mandatory side, I think, more than the discretionary side. We can scream all we want, right? People can say, oh, we're funding never-ending wars, we're doing this, we're doing that. Well, I've been in those wars, and it's funny that the people who keep saying we're fighting never-ending wars have never been in one. Right, so um, give me a break, right? You, there's some geopolitical realities as Americans we have to face, right, and, and, and we have to do that. But on the mandatory spending side, if we don't get a hold of mandatory spending, I fear, Tom, that we're gonna be in huge trouble. Um, and I think people are deathly afraid to address those issues because it doesn't poll well. Uh, that's really it, it doesn't poll well. Even though I tell you what, if, if, if you polled and asked, hey, do you want the country to go bankrupt and you have nothing, I bet that would not poll well either. So uh, I think we have that to balance. We have got to address our mandatory spending at some point. And final question, what is your wife's favorite type of barrel in which to age the whiskey? Well, for a bourbon, it would be a uh, independent stave company, Cooper Select Char 4 with toasted tops um, for our <laughs> bourbon, um, if that helps anybody. For our oh, yeah. rye, it's a Char 3. We like a little bit lighter on the rye since there's so much spice up top. We want a little bit more butterscotch or, or burnt toffee finish at the end. Um, for our wheat whiskeys, we like to go to a char two. We want a light, crisp wheat whiskey, um, but we still like to char the tops and bottoms because it gives it like that butterscotch finish or vanilla finish. Um, and as far as our moonshine, we like to take it right off there. And, and what we did is we put it in a very small bottle we measured to fit in your front or back pockets or in your inside pocket. <laughs> um, so that is called our Route 151 proof moonshine. We also call it a pocket rocket. So, um, but um, yeah, so it's uh, those kinds. So again, we can go, I can really technically go into these issues during our next forum if you'd like me to. I'd be happy right. to do that. Well, if I'm ever stuck in an elevator with a policy walk, I hope it's you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Congressman Denver. Thank Riddle. you, guys. Thank you.